All set. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you all for coming. Um, you know, I'm standing here with uh, my law enforcement partners in the Gilgo Task Force uh, to announce uh, the indictment of defendant Rex Andrew Heerman, 59 years of age. Uh, and he's been arrested by the Suffolk County uh, Police Department's homicide detectives, and he's been indicted uh, in a grand jury present, uh, presentation by the, the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office uh, for the murders of Melissa Bartholomew, Megan Waterman, and Amber Costello. Uh, the, the investigation of Maureen Brainerd Barnes is ongoing. Uh, these young women went missing between July of 2007 and September of 2010. They were found in De uh, December of 2010 by the Suffolk County Police Department, and then there was nothing, absolutely nothing. For, their, for the next 13 years, their cases went unsolved until today. Uh, when I took office in January of 2022, I made... Uh, Gilgo a priority. I made Gilgo a priority before I took office. I met uh, with the victims' families, uh, some of whom I'm proud to have standing with us today, and I told them that we were going to handle this case differently. We were going to do it differently, and that when I showed up, you weren't going to see me calling the media and being on Gilgo Beach with a giant uh, um, magnifying lens, looking for clues 12 years after the case. What I was going to do was I was going to work with my task force. We were going to form a task force. We were going to work with the Suffolk County Police Department. We were going to work with the Suffolk County Sheriff's Office. We we're going to work with the New York State uh, Police. We we're going to work with our FBI. And we were going to form this task force. And we were going to work together. And we were going to, we were going to use the grand jury, the power of the grand jury to, cut, to, to reach a determination in this case. Because the grand jury has two things. It has power, it has reach. You could obtain documents, you could interview witnesses. But the other thing that the grand jury has, the grand jury has secrecy. No one knows what you do when you operate a grand jury proceeding. And we knew that when we were investigating this case and it, when we dealt with the media or whatever it was we were doing, um, we, were, we were playing uh, before a party of one because we knew uh, the person responsible for these murders would be looking at us. So we were very careful uh, how we, we, we handled the investigation. We maintained the integrity of the investigation. Uh, most, important, uh, most importantly of all, we maintained the secrecy uh, of that investigation. And I think that's, uh, that's paid dividends uh, as we've seen today. Now, um, I, you know, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, when we had the, uh, the task force, uh, the first thing we did, got together with uh, um, Suffolk County Police Commissioner Rodney Harrison, uh, and we formed the task force. Our first meeting uh, was February, February 1st of 2022. Uh, and what we did, what all of the agencies here, we made the commitment. We were going to take our talented, our most talented investigators. So in the district attorney's office, we took uh, uh, ADAs, myself included. We took analysts. We took detective investigators. And they worked on a daily basis with other talented investigators from all of the agencies here. Um, and uh, we started that in February 1st of 2022. Six weeks later, on March 14th, 2022, the name Rex Heurman was first mentioned as a suspect uh, in the Gilgo case. A New York State uh, investigator was able to, uh, to um, identify him in a database. Uh, and from that point on, we used the power of the grand jury, over 300 subpoenas and search warrants, uh, looking into this, this individual's background to bring us to this day. So I'm, I am, uh, I'm proud, I, I know that this case is over, but I'm proud of what we've accomplished up to this point. I know we have more to accomplish, but I'm also uh, thankful, thankful for the partnership uh, of, of the task force, because certainly without the participation of the task force, we wouldn't be standing here. Um, you know, before I, I, you know, I thank some, some folks and, and turn it over to, uh, to 
uh, our, our partners. I just want to talk a little bit about the, the evidence in the case. Uh, I know uh, a lot of people know about the case. As I indicated, uh, the, uh, the victims went missing between July of 2010 and September, uh, I'm sorry, July of 2007 and uh, September of 2010. Uh, and uh, in December of 2010, they were, uh, the, their, their bodies were recovered. Uh, they were buried in a similar fashion, in a similar location, um, uh, in, a, in a similar way. Uh, all the women were petite. Uh, they were, um, they, they all did the same thing for a living. Uh, they all advertised the same way. Uh, and there were, uh, immediately, there were similarities with regard uh, to the, to the, uh, the crime scenes. Uh, all the women's, all the women were bound at the head, uh, at the midsection, uh, uh, or at the chest, and later at the legs. Um, the other thing I think that that um, uh, was was uh, that's been talked about in the uh, in the media was they were bound by um, burlap. Uh, media, uh, that has taken a life of its own in the media, and the burlap has has been described or thought to be. Uh, the burlap that's used at a nursery for uh, it, that's not the burlap that was used in this case the burlap is it was camouflage burlap uh, used for duck blinds so hunting um, uh, so uh, I, obviously it, it, it was used to hide uh, purposely hide the bodies um, one thing that became immediately apparent uh, th was at the time of the uh, each of the murders uh, the murderer the the defendant Herman uh, he got a, a uh, he got a, a cell phone uh, and a burner phone, which uh, which is prepaid and anonymous. And for each of the murders, he got an individual burner phone, and he used that to communicate with the victims. Uh, then, shortly after uh, the death of the victims, uh, he then would uh, would get rid of the burner phone. Uh, and uh, right away in December of 2012. Uh, FBI uh, cast analysts, uh, special agents with the cast unit of the FBI, they immediately began looking at that cell site uh, uh, data. They compared the victims' phones with, uh, with the burner phones, and they immediately uh, honed in on some, some sim similarities, specifically uh, in the Massapequa Park area. And they looked at the, an area of a confluence of four cell towers uh, and they realized that this was had uh, significance because uh, the the uh, perp perpetrator of these crimes was probably located within this area uh, during at or around the times of the murder, uh, and that was mapped out. That was called the box, and it was an area uh, in Massapequa Park. Uh, the FBI also managed to do that for an area in mid Midtown Manhattan. Um, and so that was that was an investigative lead. The other uh, investigative lead at the time was even though there, there was a significant amount of time that elapsed with regard to uh, before the the the, uh, the victims were recovered, there was some uh, some significant evidence recovered. Uh, specifically, there was a uh, um, hair recovered from Maureen uh, Brainerd Barnes from a belt buckle that was around her legs. Uh, there, uh, with regard to Megan Waterman, uh, there were three hairs recovered um, uh, from from her. Uh, one uh, from around her head area, one from around her, her her leg area in the burlap, and then there was one caught in between the tape, uh, and uh, that was recovered. Uh, Amber Costello also had a hair, a significant hair that was recovered uh, during the time uh, during the, the time of the recovery, but. Uh, again, uh, the crime scene, because it w was out there for so long and because uh, it was exposed to the elements, uh, those hairs were degraded, so you couldn't use traditional DNA um, analysis on it. You would, uh, you would have to wait uh, and use mitochondrial DNA. And back in uh, 2010, the technology wasn't there for mitochondrial DNA. So the investigation proceeded, but also technology proceeded as well. Uh, and then in January and February of 2022, we, we formed the task force. We began working uh, collectively. Uh, and then a mere six weeks later, on March 14th, 2022, Rex Heurman was identified for the first time. Uh, and the ma manner in which that was done was uh, the New York State investigator looked at a database. Uh, Amber Costello, the day before her uh, disappearance on September 1st, 
2010, uh, she, uh, uh, con uh, she um, met with an, an individual for the purposes of, of having him pay her money uh, for, for her services. Um, but she, uh, she, would involve, she involved herself in a ruse where once the, the individual gave her, uh, gave her money, and uh, other individuals came into the, the house, pretended to be a significant others, confronted the individual uh, with the purpose of, of making that individual uncomfortable, having him leave without retrieving his money. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, so uh, that individual was identified as, as a person who was between 6'4 and 6'6, uh, a, a large man, thickly built, not necessarily overly muscular, but just a naturally a big person with glasses, white, uh, and, and dark hair. Uh, also of significance was um, that the fact that he was driving a dark colored or black uh, av uh, uh, first, uh, first generation uh, Chevrolet Avalanche with a, a, a very uh, unique feature that was between the, the, it was a pickup truck, so it was between the cab and the bed. Uh, and that was identified. Again, that was back uh, in uh, 2010. Uh, but it, w it wasn't until uh, March of, of, of 2022 uh, that that database uh, was, by, was, was, dis was searched uh, by the, the task force, uh, and this individual uh, uh, was, was identified. Uh, that, uh, that individual was uh, Rex Hurman, the defendant. Uh, and right away, there were some con commonalities that came right to the fore. Rex Yerman, 6'4", largely uh, a large person, not necessarily uh, muscular, but a, a very uh, physically large person. Uh, he has glasses, uh, he, has, he has that the dark hair, and also, a particular note, he owned, at the time, that first generation Chevy Avalanche. Uh, but there was more. Uh, he lived at 105 First Avenue, which was located within that box area that the FBI first uh, discovered in, in 2012. Uh, but there was more. Uh, also, he worked at the time at an architect, as an ar and, uh, he owned his own architectural firm uh, at an address at 19 West 36th Street in Mid Midtown Manhattan. And that was also the area of interest that was identified by the FBI in 2012. Uh, again, that was March 14th, uh, 2022. Uh, and from that point on, our, po our partners and uh, my office, we used the grand jury to continue to investigate, and we executed over 300 subpoenas, search warrants pertaining to this individual to find out more information. Uh, one of the things that we did is we followed him because we wanted to get an abandonment sample of his DNA, uh, which we were able to do. Uh, we also got uh, DNA samples, abandonment samples from his family. And then we went back and we got mitochondrial DNA testing. And with regard to, um, you know, and, you know, uh, there's, an, itch, there's a, uh, an aspect of New York State law that doesn't allow me to talk about uh, DNA testing, uh, specifically at press conferences. It's, um, so I can't do that. However, at the... Um, at the uh, uh, arraignment, uh, and also when we filed our bail letter, we talked about the significance of that uh, evidence. So, if anyone needs to see that, but but uh, suffice to say, uh, that evidence was, was significant, uh, especially with regard to uh, the other evidence that we had developed. But it was uh, there was uh, another interesting aspect. We looked at the Yerman family uh, travel records, and we learned that during the murders of uh, the last three women, um, Bartholome, Waterman, and Costello, that during the commission of those murders, the, the, uh, the defendant's wife and children were, at, were out of New York State, and he was alone in the tri-state area. Uh, we also went back and looked at his cell site records, and we, were, we, we compared his personal cell site records with that of the four target phones, and we saw that there was areas of commonality. In other words, that whenever the, the target phones would, uh, would, would bounce off a cell tower, if, if the uh, Yerman uh, personal phone 
uh, bounced off a, a, a tower. It was always consistent and in close proximity uh, with the target phones. And at no time was there ever an instant where those target phones were, for instance, in New Jersey while uh, the defendant was, was on Long Island. Uh, so that was completely um, uh, consistent. The other thing that we looked at was uh, we looked at his use of burner phones, uh, and we, we followed, using the grand jury, using the great investigative help from our partners, we followed his use of burner phones. We were able to uh, identify seven separate burner phones that he used. We were able to use fictitious uh, or fraudulent email addresses and get Google warrants, and from there, we got his searches. Uh, and we learned uh, what we, what uh, the individual, what the defendant was searching. Uh, in a 14-month period, he had over 200 searches pertaining to uh, the Gilgo investigation. Uh, not only were those, uh, was he looking at uh, in investigative insight, uh, he was looking, trying to figure out how is the task force using cell phones to try to figure out what's happening. What are the developments with regard to the task force? And this, uh, this really um, um, supported our decision to keep our investigative um, focus secret because we knew that this one person would be watching and we didn't want to give him uh, any insight into what we were doing. And we also didn't want him to know just how close we were getting. Uh, so we maintained the, the, the grand jury secrecy and we maintained the integrity of our investigation. Uh, in addition to those, those uh, um, uh, Gilgo searches, he was searching, compulsively searching pictures of the victims, but not only pictures of the victims, pictures of their, uh, their uh, relatives, their, their, their sisters, uh, their children, uh, and he was trying to locate those individuals. Uh, in addition to that, there was a lot of uh, torture, uh, porn, and, and uh, um, what you would consider, uh, you know, uh, um, depictions of women uh, being abused, uh, being raped, and being killed. Um, in addition to all of that, uh, we continued to look, uh, and uh, we uh, were able to uh, determine uh, that that Chevy Avalanche that was used during the commission of the Amber Costello crime uh, that Chevy Avalanche was in South Carolina. And again, with the help of our uh, partners, uh, we were able to capture, uh, we were able to seize that uh, uh, Chevy Avalanche pursuant to a search warrant, and we're certainly going to analyze that. In addition to that, uh, pursuant to the arrest of the defendant last night by the Suffolk County uh, Police Department, we, we obtained one of his burner phones, his last burner phones. Uh, the investigate, as I said, the, this case is not over. It's only beginning. We're continuing to execute search warrants, and we anticipate getting more evidence. Uh, before I, I turn it over to my partners, I, I, I want to I wanna thank a lot of people in the room. First and foremost, I want to thank the victims in this case. You know, it's always inspiring as a prosecutor when you get to meet uh, the victims. Uh, and while sometimes our defendants could embody the very worst of humanity, it seems that invariably our victims embody the very best of what it means uh, to be human. And uh, in this case, it was no, no different. Uh, I've gotten to know the families, and I'm inspired by them, and I'm impressed by their patience uh, and by their, their dogged uh, persistence in not only supporting uh, their, their lost uh, sisters or, 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 or mother uh, or, or daughter, uh, but also really, uh, you know, really standing for victims a a everywhere. So I, I want to I wanna, I wanna thank them all uh, so much. Uh, and I want to let them know that we're going to continue to work this case. Um, the next thing I want to do, I just want to thank, I th want to thank uh, our partners. I want to thank uh, Suffolk County Police Commissioner Rodney Harrison. Um, you know, we said it was a change. And when we talked about, you know, not going before the media, if you see, um, you know, Rodney did go before the media. Uh, but it was always in a very controlled manner, and it was always with a controlled purpose. Again, we did that because we knew we were playing before a, an audience of one person. 
Uh, and so I want to thank Rodney for his partnership. Uh, most importantly, I want to thank Rodney for his integrity. I think in the past, what the reason why uh, uh, these various investigations fell short was because there was a lot of outside influence, a lot of people who had nothing to do with the investigation, nothing to do with the, um, uh, the, the uh, investigation or any of the agencies that were actually handling the investigation. They still asserted pressure on those investigations. That did not happen with our task force. Our task force were, was run by our members, uh, and we did uh, what we thought was in the best, uh, the best investigative steps and what was in the best interest of the, of the investigation. So I want to thank Rodney for that uh, and, and his whole team. I, I know that we have Suffolk County homicide here, Kevin Beyer. Uh, we, we, we've got uh, Inspector Rowan. Uh, and I know that they've been around, and I know that they're here, and I know that they stand in the shoes of their past investigators, and I want to congratulate them, and I want to thank them for their partnership. Uh, I also want to thank uh, uh, Sheriff Errol Toulon. Everything I said about uh, Rodney, I could say about Errol. Uh, Errol uh, is an unbelievable partner. Uh, he was an unbelievable partner in this case. Uh, during the dependency of this case, and one of the reasons why we, we had to take this case down was we learned that the defendant was using these alternate uh, um, identities and these alternate instruments to continue to patronize sex workers, uh, which of course made us very nervous. Uh, but with, with the help of, of um, the sheriff and his database and his uh, analysts, we were able to continually uh, stay uh, one, uh, one step ahead of the defendant. So, so thank you, uh, Sheriff Toulon. I want to thank um, the FBI. I know um, Assistant Director in Charge Michael Brodak is here. I want to thank his entire team. You know, when you have the FBI, uh, not only do you have tremendous resources uh, and insight, uh, whether it's the Behavioral uh, Sciences Unit, whether it's CAST, uh, whether it's CART, which is their computer unit, but you also have the ability to seize a car in uh, South Carolina. I can't seize a car in South Carolina without uh, the FBI. So, so thank you for that, uh, and thank you for your partnership, and thank you for for, for your willingness uh, to work with us. I want to I want to um, thank the New York State Troopers. Uh, I know Major Udis is here and his team. Uh, you know, uh, this case is is emblematic of of great cooperation, but we always get that same level of cooperation from the state police. Uh, no matter what uh, case we're working, so I want to thank them. Their investigators did a great uh, um, uh, did great work on this job and uh, in this case, and we couldn't have done it without them. Um, lastly, I want to thank uh, Nassau County Police Commissioner Pat Ryder. I don't know if he's here. Did he make it? <laughs> um, you know, this this case, as I said, spans you know thir thirteen years, and during that time. Um, you know, Pat Ryder has been our neighbor to the West. When it started, I think he was a sergeant, uh, detective sergeant, maybe a uniform sergeant, but whatever, whenever we needed something to be done or whenever the task force needed uh, something to be done, uh, Pat Ryder would do it, and he would do it quietly without much fanfare, and we know he would keep the confidentiality of our grand jury and our investigation. So I want to thank him for that. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to uh, Commissioner Rodney Harrison. Good afternoon. Today is a good day. And before I acknowledge the individuals that had a role in getting to this place, I would first and foremost like to offer my deepest condolences to the family members. To the family members of Amber Costello, Melissa Bartholomew, Megan Waterman. I can only imagine what you had to adore over the last decade regarding knowing that your killer was still loose. God bless you.
So I've had, I've had the privilege of being the police commissioner nearly about two years now. And uh, I have had that investigative experience in the NYPD uh, as a detective, as the chief of detectives. And when I was going through the process of being the police commissioner, my engagement with the county executive was I was very familiar with this unfortunate homicides. And I wanted to let it be known that this was going to be our number one priority. But I also want to make this very clear, that this arrest was made by the investigators assigned to the task force. I announced during a press conference 18 months ago about a new team effort that was going to investigate the homicide, and that was going to consist of people from Ray Tierney's office, from Mike Brodack, FBI. Mike, thank you so much. State Police, Steve, appreciate your support. Dr. Earl Talon, Jr., thank you, sir. As well as the investigators from the homicide detectives in Suffolk County. Gentlemen, thank you for all you've done working together with us, making sure we are here today. I also want to thank my partner, Pat Ryder. Pat, good seeing you, man. And uh, former NYPD Police Commissioner, Keyshawn Sewell, for providing resources to assist in the investigation that brought us here today. So one of my first acts was to survey the scene. When I first got assigned as a police commissioner, me and Kevin Breyer went over to Gilgo Beach. I want to uh, thank Kevin. You know, when I first met Kevin, he broke the whole case down and where we stood. He knew the case like the back of his hand. He worked tirelessly in this case. Uh, Kev was in charge of overseeing the task force since its creation, and you did a phenomenal job, Kev. Thank you. So there's something that I learned from a former NYPD police commissioner, James O'Neill, which is in order to fight crime or to solve investigations, you have to make sure you're working with your law enforcement partners. The blueprint in making this arrest was a whole team effort. Everybody left their eagles at the door and made sure that they brought the knowledge and the resources to this investigation. Fresh eyes on this case and the resiliency of our investigators allowed us to identify Rex Hureman. Ladies and gentlemen, Rex Hureman is a demon that walks among us, a predator that ruined families. And if not for the members of this task force, he would still be on the streets today. However, even with this arrest, we're not done. There's more work to do in this investigation regarding the other victims of the Gilgo Beach bodies that were discovered. I'm going to encourage anybody that still has information, call our Crime Stoppers hotline, 1-800-220-TIPS. I want to recognize and thank my Chief of Detectives, John. Thank you for your great work. Deputy Police Commissioner Anthony Carter, both of you who provided update information regarding the case and let it be known if there was any resources that they needed that sh you brought it to my attention. Since the discovery of the first victim, there's been a lot of scrutiny and criticism regarding how this investigation was handled. I will tell you this, the investigators were never discouraged. They continued and, and uncovered evidence and followed leads. They never stopped working and will continue to work tirelessly until we bring justice to all the families involved. Last but not least, I want to thank my predecessors uh, that came before me, the work that they did. 
I want to thank them for really uh, laying the foundation that helped us get to here today. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Michael Brodak. I'm the FBI Special Agent in Charge of the New York Office's Criminal Division. The FBI expanded its full set of resources in support of our local and state partners to advance this investigation. The charges show that we can overcome the most difficult challenges when federal, state, and local law enforcement work together under one task force. While nothing can fill the void caused by the loss of a loved one, through today's announcement, we are hopeful that the families of the victims begin to experience a sense of peace, closure, and justice, and that the general public feels safer knowing that an alleged killer is no longer roaming free. The actions taken today should serve as a reminder that the FBI, along with our law enforcement partners, will continue to be resolute in our determination to bring all offenders to justice, no matter how many years has passed. I would like to thank Suffolk County District Attorney Ray Tierney and his prosecution team, Suffolk County Police Commissioner Rodney Harrison and the Suffolk County Police Department, the New York State Police, and the investigators and staff of the FBI New York Field Office, including the Long Island Violent Crime Task Force. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dr. Errol D. Toulon, Jr., and I'm the sheriff of Suffolk County. I would profoundly like to thank the district attorney and the police commissioner uh, for including me not only here today, but for including the Suffolk County Sheriff's Office and recognizing the importance of jail intelligence. It is extremely important when you realize that we created our human trafficking unit in 2018, that there are victims in our community and that intelligence is being shared by many of the men and women who are incarcerated today. And we have seen many disjointed investigations occur, and leading up to the leadership of these two men have really brought everything together. I am proud that today we stand here a little bit closer to bringing closure to the families and extend my deepest condolences to all of you. Because of the nature of this case, and recognizing that human trafficking and corrections intelligence is so important, we realize that there are many other cases that are going on that will, we will help to solve going forward. So I thank my intelligence staff and team that are here today for their diligence and their work. While we did our part in this investigation, we continue because we have to house this individual. We have already designated uh, or talked about certain locations where we will house them, and in addition, the security measures we will implement in our facility uh, to make sure that this individual is brought to justice the way he should be. Thank you very much, and have a good day. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Colonel Richard Allen, uh, the field commander with the state police. And I want to start by expressing my, my sincere condolences to the family members that are here today. Although losing a loved one, you can never completely get rid of that pain, but hopefully these steps that are taken here today are a step in the right direction for you to start in the healing process or work through the healing process. I want to thank the members of the task force, all the agencies you see behind me. When we were approached in 2022 to be part of this task force, we were fully engaged. Um, glad to be part of this. Uh, we, we assign investigators on a full-time basis. You know, what, what you see um, being done here today is, is the end game of agencies working together, as it was said before, with no egos, all egos put aside, with the sole mission to find justice for these victims. You know, um, here in, in Troop L, Major Steven Udis oversees the operations down here. He has been intricately involved in this task force since we became partners with it. And I'm going to ask him to come up and, and say a few words or expand upon this uh, a little bit, our role in the, in the task force. Thank you, Colonel.
Good afternoon. I'm Major Steve Utis, New York State Police Troop L, Long Island Troop Commander. I'd like to take this opportunity to start off by acknowledging the DA, Ray Tierney, and Commissioner Rodney Harrison for having the vision to see that forming a task force might breed new light into this investigation. The state police were asked in early 2022 to join this task force, and once requested, we were more than willing to do so. We were also very pleased that we were able to make some very meaningful contributions in this case to help propel it forward. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all of the task force members from the different agencies and congratulate them on a job well done. I think this case represents an example of what we as law enforcement can do when we pool our resources together and we work together. I would also like to mention the state police member assigned to this task force. You were provided with a mission, and that mission was to participate in this task force, put everything else that you were doing aside, assume, place 100% of your attention on this case, and help push this case forward. You more than accomplished that mission. I congratulate you on a job well done, and I commend you for your outstanding work. To the families, I'd like to say that on behalf of myself and the New York State Police, we offer you our deepest condolences. We recognize that these crimes may have happened years ago, but that pain continues. Our hope is that this development today provides you with some relief and some comfort, knowing that the person responsible for, the, for your loved one's death is now being held accountable and he's no longer a threat to anyone else in society. I want you to know, additionally, that the state police is not done here. We are remaining committed and will continue to support the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office, the Suffolk County Police Department, and this task force as we move into the next phase of this process. That's the prosecution. I would also like to say something to everyone watching this with us today. There's been a lot of discussion here today about charges, about the suspect, about what happened, but I would also like everybody to take the, the time to join with me and keep the families of the victims and the victims themselves in your thoughts and in your prayers. Each one of these victims was a family member and a loved one, and their void and their loss caused great pain, and they did not deserve this. Nobody is deserving of this. We hope this development today will bring some comfort to them as they move forward. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? You know, uh, sure. Before I do that, I just, you know, I'm, I'm standing back there. I realize I didn't thank my own team. Um, so <laughs> uh, so I, I want to thank, uh, I want to thank my chief investigator, Rick Zacharis, uh, who is uh, without, uh, I am so lucky to have. I want to thank uh, Nick Santamartino, ADA Nick Santamartino, uh, ADA Michelle Haddad, ADA uh, Andrew Lee. Uh, I also want to thank my, my chief uh, assistant, uh, uh, Alan Bodie, and I want to thank all of the incredible, incredible analysts uh, that we have working for us at the Suffolk County DA's office. So, uh, ha having said that, I will now answer your question. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think that there was a tension in 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 the task force, and it was a, it was a, it was a good tension uh, because, you know, there's a tension between getting the the evidence necessary to charge somebody, but also keeping the public safe. Uh, and that's the tension that we always deal with. Uh, so as we were working forward, we were, and, and you know, we had uh, Suffolk County PD, we had the FBI uh, surveilling the defendant. Uh, obviously, that can't be all the time, uh, but we were, you know, we were reasonably assured with that. Uh, but this individual was, was, was a person that continued to uh, patronize sex workers at all hours of the night. Uh, he continued to use fictitious, um, um, email addresses, fictitious identities, burner phones. Uh, and so as we, we worked through the case uh, and we got closer and closer, uh, all of a sudden, and we built the evidence, 
suddenly the balance tips uh, in favor of, uh, of public safety. So, uh, you know, I think we, we wanted, we all wanted as a task force to continue it, but uh, I think collectively we felt that it was time uh, to, to, you know, to strike that balance and, 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 and to take him off the street. So that's what we did. I, I don't believe they, uh, does, that, does anyone, anybody want to say anything? No, they're, they're here, they're, they're, I can tell you they're the Waterman, uh, uh, Bartholomew, and Brainerd Barnes uh, family members, but uh, they're here, uh, they're here first and foremost to support uh, their loved ones, and we're, we're, we're happy and grateful to have them here. The, uh, this, this portion had to deal with the deaths of these four young women, uh, and that's what we focused on. That was what the grand jury investigation was focused on. I talked about the commonalities, uh, and the commonalities, uh, all of those commonalities that we talked to were uh, unique to these uh, four separate cases, uh, so that's what we're uh, working on. I think the other uh, members of the task force said, you know, we've got, we're going to continue. Uh, you know, and continue to work and investigate and try to get a small measure of closure for all the victims' families. But for right now, uh, this defendant, uh, it's this defendant with these, 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 uh, these four victims. Is there information coming from the court? Is there something that you're mentioning that would help other members? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm here to talk about uh, what we did with regard to these four victims. And as I, I open my, my, um, my uh, ad address by talking about the need to maintain uh, investigative secrecy. So we are going to maintain that investigative secrecy. And when I talk about other individuals and other cases, it will be after they have uh, they have handcuffs on. The so. I mean, you know, we talked about uh, we talked about you know some of the evidence that was there. Uh, you know, obviously the cast uh, that that, uh, that phone evidence uh, was 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 great evidence. Um, and then there were other commonalities. There were other inv uh, investi uh, investigations. But I think one of the good things about having a task force is basically you strip it all down uh, and you start from scratch. And then you use the DA's office because the DA's office has to get you uh, li the lifeblood. Of, of an investigation is information. And the way you get information on a cold case is the district attorney's office issues subpoenas in conjunction with the investigators and execute search warrants, again, in conjunction with the, with the, um, uh, the investigators. And, you, and then, you, then you mine all that data, and then, and then you let that data take you where you need to go. So that's what we did in this case. And six weeks in, uh, the, uh, the break in the case, uh, a significant break in the case, was uh, was the uh, was the avalanche and the fact that this guy, uh, you know, he was described by witnesses as an ogre. He 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 matched the description of the ogre and where he lived. Was the avalanche just an incident? Is that that just turned out? Well, I mean, it was it was a lot of things, right? It was it was it was his uh, physical size. It was his uh, where he lived, where he worked. Uh, the fact that his uh, um, family members were out of the country at the time of the commission of the three murders. Uh, the fact that um, he, he now then you start looking into him and then you start getting burner phones. Well, he has, uh, we had up to seven burner phones. He's using these f fictitious email addresses. Um, so then, so then you, you follow him and you get an abandonment sample. Then you go back to some of the old evidence. So it's, you know, there, there, are, there are, I mean, March 14th, uh, 2022 was a huge day for the task force. But, uh, you know, it, it's, it's never one piece of evidence. Well, there's, I mean, there's, there's like the, what they, they'll call lawman searches, and basically what it is is, is you run a certain make and model of a car and certain other, you know, where you live or, or what you do for a living, and then you get data, and then you mine that data for something that would would, would uh, match with uh, with your uh, with your case, and you do that. You don't do that just, you know, you do that a hundred times, you know, until until it hits, until you get the right data points. So we can't we, we can't talk about um, we can't talk about uh, ethically in New York we can't talk about any statements the defendant made but he uh, you know he made uh, 
we, we're not turning over any statements. Uh, so. <laughs> um, I would say he was, yeah. Yeah. So the, in between the in between the bed and the and the and the the cab, there's like a little triangular uh, um, ornament almost, and it, it's it's unique in the way it's configured. It's unique to to the avalanche. It was unique to the avalanche at that time, uh, and that was something that was pointed out by by witnesses. Why is that unique to the avalanche? What? Well, you know, the investigation is is continuing, and and I would never say never. Um, and we're going to continue to look at again. Now th this is a, a watershed event in the in in this case, uh, and so we've now uh, are going out and we're we're ex executing more search warrants. We'll get more information, more data, and you know together uh, we'll look at that and see where it leads. Do you think there was other than the Spaniards killing the dog? I'm sorry. Do you think that there were other than the Spaniards killing the dog? Which uh, the, uh, so so this investigation had to do with um, uh, th these these four victims. So we've been in touch with the four victims through the grand jury uh, process um, with regard to victims in general and, and other victims uh, you know who lost people in the vicinity of that area. You know we speak uh, to to our victims all the time, but that that's those are conversations that we keep between ourselves. So, uh, you know, it, it's, um, uh, so first off, Maureen Brainer Barnes, she, the, the other uh, three, one, uh, one was, was, uh, was went uh, uh, missing in 2009, uh, I believe the others in 2010. Um, she was in 2007, so it, it, was, it was a little bit more remote in time. Uh, we are, um, we are uh, pro uh, working through evidence. A lot of that evidence has to do with forensic evidence. Uh, and analyses that are not completed, uh, but once those analyses are completed, uh, we are we are uh, we feel good about the case, and we're going to just continue to let that process go. And again, I think the the the, the um, initial plan was to allow the grand jury investigation to go a little uh, further, but uh, at a certain time, uh, again, the, the the task force felt, you know, we need to uh, we we for for for. for Reasons having nothing to do with the evidence in the case, we need to take it down. Can you just sum up this defense? It's been a lot. Can you just sum up this defense in the grand jury investigation? Um, you know, he's. Uh, you know, it's it's it's. Um, as a prosecutor and as investigators, you know, he is charged with a crime. Uh, there are certain elements in which we ha we need to prove that crime. We are going to prove those elements. We're going to work hard. We're going to convict him, and we're going to hold uh, him responsible for what he did. And whether, you know, what I think of him personally, whether I like him, whether I don't like him, whether I, doesn't matter. We are going to hold him responsible for what he did in this case. What is the grand jury intent on um, The grand jury is, um, it's a secret, uh, and we're going to keep it secret. Um, uh, but we have an investigation, and it is continuing. Sure does. I mean, uh, you know, he has an H in his name. He has, uh, so it's, what was it, HM? Or WH? Yeah, so he's got an H in his name and other, um, other relatives in, in his family have a W in their name. What that means? Um, I think that when you look at his uh, internet searches, um, you know, I, I think that um, uh, provides a little uh, in, uh, in, insight into his state of mind. Um, and again, we don't have to prove motive, we have to prove the elements, and that's what we're going to do. Well, uh, you know, you you, uh, you know, you said woman. Um, you know, with regard to the sex workers, what we did was uh, we we had him under surveillance. Uh, we had other means of monitoring him. 
uh, and again, it's uh, it's a um, it's a process, and and that process is you have to balance uh, the ability to to to, pr to find e enough evidence to charge them and hold them responsible with the balance of keeping the public safe, uh, and it's it's not easy. Uh, and we decided at a certain point in time that the you know that we needed to take them down because we didn't feel comfortable with it. So that's what we did. Um, I don't think it was so much. Uh, I don't. I don't think it was so much uh, uh, the searches. I think. I think that the conduct of the defendant was was very consistent. I think, but uh, the the quality of our evidence was increasing uh, by the by the by the day by the moment uh, due to the great work of our, our task force uh, uh, partners. So at, at a certain point in time, we're like, okay, uh, you know, we can we can do this. Uh, the uh, uh, the um, uh, I believe the uh, the cause of death is homicidal violence. Obviously, uh, given the length of time and 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 the exposure to a very harsh environment, uh, forensically there there uh, was not uh, you know not a, a lot that that could be done with with, with the remains other than uh, come to that conclusion. He has, uh, he has, uh, he has uh, uh, permits for 92 guns. He has a very large safe in which guns are kept. Uh, we are uh, continuing to um, execute search warrants, so I'm sure we'll have that uh, answer uh, shortly. I'm sorry. I think there's, I think there's, uh, with, uh, there's always concerns. I think, you know, we, I, I got into office in January 22. Uh, we worked with our partners. We, we had our first meeting uh, February 1st, uh, and we worked, and, and, you know, March 14th was really that watershed day. And when I tell you, you know, I'd like to brag and say that my office was really working hard, which we were, uh, but no other agency was working any less hard than we were. Once we realized what we had and we realized the stakes, all of our partnership, uh, all of our partners really worked. Uh, I mean, I, I think if you look at, at the folks standing here, uh, I don't think that, you know, in the last 48 hours, any of us have gotten more than three hours sleep. Uh, we are going to continue our investigation, and when we are prepared, when we have concluded that investigation, uh, we will, uh, you know, we will will bring that uh, to a conclusion, but we will not do it before. All right, thank you. I, you know, and I, I don't want to tell you, you know, exact uh, investigative techniques because they're, you know, again, part of the what reasons why they're um, effective is because people don't necessarily know what that, uh, what, what it is exactly we do. But uh, always a concern, but given the professionalism of our partners, uh, their diligence and their commitment, uh, we felt good about, about the case uh, or keeping the case going until we didn't, and then we took it down. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thanks, guys.